In the beautiful countryside of Sri Lanka, the average farmer toils away, getting ready to plant and tediously care for next year's rice harvest. The occasional greedy elephant usually complicates things, but now the farmers must contend with something much worse. What was to take a decade in a strange effort to make Sri Lanka the first entirely organic food supplier caught farmers by surprise when, in early 2021, the government announced the country would immediately stop the importation of critically needed fertilizer. With supply shortages caused by the lockdowns in 2020, food prices were already on the rise. Now, with the geopolitical shocks in Europe's breadbasket and the unsurprising halving in Sri Lanka's agricultural output, the price of food for the average citizen has skyrocketed. But the government's gross mismanagement in agriculture is just a small symptom in a much larger problem. Sri Lanka has run out of money and is now facing down the barrel of complete economic collapse. In a span of just two years, its reserves of foreign currency has gone from 9.2 billion to just 50 million. Not enough to cover a single day's worth of imports, and not nearly enough to cover the 6.6 .6 billion it needs to make loan payments. On April 12th, the government announced it will no longer be making such payments. As a result, it's been cut off from international loans. Basic necessities are hard to come by, and daily rolling blackouts are shutting down businesses. The streets are descending into chaos and violence not seen since its terrible 30-year civil war. Yet Sri Lanka may not be alone, and could be the first domino to fall in a global economic crisis for poorly managed developing countries. But how did Sri Lanka get into this mess in the first place? What is likely to happen next? And what does it mean for the rest of the world? This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. While browsing the internet, scrolling through social media, or even watching this video right now, your data is vulnerable to being collected, stored, and sold. This is where a VPN comes in handy. If you don't already know, a VPN or virtual private network protects you by rerouting your data traffic through an encrypted virtual tunnel. And that's why I've teamed up with the premier VPN, Private Internet Access. If you haven't already heard about them, they have over 30 million downloads. That is because they are the world's most transparent VPN that never logs its users' data. It's also the most customizable VPN on the market, allowing you to take your privacy to the next level. You can even use it to stream content that may be blocked in your country. They use world-class next-gen server infrastructure in over 83 countries, meaning you get a secure, reliable VPN connection anytime and anywhere. And in case you were worried, not only your computer, but up to 10 different devices can be protected with one subscription. Signing up for private internet access is risk-free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, plus their highly skilled customer support team of experts is available 24-7. For my audience, you can click on the link in my description to get 82% off a two-year plan, plus a free three months, all for just $2.11 a month. Today on paper, Sri Lanka is not a poor country. According to the UN, its development rivals Eastern European nations, it has more production per person than Indonesia, Egypt, and South Africa, and it sits on an incredibly important global shipping lane. It's the world's fourth largest producer of black tea and a major exporter of natural rubber, spices, and precious metals. For the past two decades, it's been one of the fastest growing South Asian countries. It is blessed with natural beauty, stunning beaches and world-famous wildlife. As a result, Sri Lanka experienced a massive boom in tourism, which led to its breakneck growth. From the end of its civil war in 2009 to 2018, the number of visitors each year increased fivefold, bringing in huge sums of foreign currency. Sri Lanka, being a small developing country, imports a huge amount of commodities. As such, it's been running a large trade deficit. This means that it buys more foreign goods than it sells to foreign nations. But many nations run large deficits. The United States, for example, runs a trade deficit of 600 billion US dollars worth of goods. But Sri Lanka does not print US dollars. It prints Sri Lankan rupees. When it buys oil from the UAE or sells tea to China, it does not trade rupees. It trades US dollars. This means there is an incredibly intricate dance the government must undertake to manage the flow in and out of dollars. For the past decade, tourism propped up Sri Lanka's growth, its supply of foreign currency, its government spending, and its imports. However, in 2019, Sri Lanka was reminded of its scars. 
On Easter Sunday 2019, massive terrorist attacks rocked the small island nation, instantly plummeting the number of tourists from 244,000 a month to just 38,000, thus crippling its main pipeline of dollars. Under the threat of economic stagnation and the rise in social unrest, Sri Lankans elected the strongman Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Gota built a name for himself, viciously ending the civil war as head of the Ministry of Defense with his brother Mahinda acting as president from 2005 to 2015. Gota ran on the promise of bringing forth vistas of prosperity and splendor. In wake of an opposition party seen as too weak to handle domestic threats, Gota's party won a landslide victory in parliament, and he appointed his brother as prime minister. With a two-thirds majority, Gota quickly got to work, rewriting the constitution, allowing him to appoint many top-level officials, including ministers and judges. He stuffed these positions with relatives and has been slowly cementing greater unrestrained power. In light of the downturn in tourism, Gota irresponsibly slashed taxes and started printing large sums of money. Government revenue collapsed, the budget deficit widened, and its stockpile of foreign currency started to burn away. But Sri Lanka's bad luck was just beginning. Of all the industries that the 2020 lockdowns crippled, none were hit harder and faster than tourism. The 2019 Sri Lankan attacks were seen as a short-term hit to its most important industry. The lockdowns quickly snuffed out hopes of a quick recovery. Now more than ever, Sri Lanka was burning through its foreign reserves. This was further accelerated by the government's desire to keep the rupees exchange rate at 200 rupees equal to 1 US dollar. See, in a free and untethered market, two currencies and their exchange rates are determined by demand. A slowdown in Sri Lanka's tourism and thus economic outlook should reduce the demand for its currency. As such, it would then require more Sri Lankan rupees to equal a US dollar. But this means that imports become much more expensive and the cost of everyday items for Sri Lankans increases. If this change is too drastic and things such as food and power become unaffordable to the average person, then the risk of political turmoil increases in turn. Goda and his officials knew this. In order to keep the currency fixed to a certain dollar amount, they must use some of their foreign currency to buy rupees. If they buy just enough, then the demand for the two currencies returns and the 200 rupee per dollar exchange rate stays. This can slow rapid inflation, but it requires the government to spend a lot more of its foreign reserves. This was dramatic in Sri Lanka, dropping its reserves from 9.2 billion to just 1.6 billion in 2021. This caused the government to enact strange policies like banning the importation of fertilizer in hopes of easing its trade deficit. Claiming the ban was to make Sri Lanka organic was simply a way to conceal its dire situation. The decision was quickly scrapped as unsurprisingly to everyone besides maybe Gota, food output was cut in half overnight. Sri Lanka was on a course toward bankruptcy already, but then it was hit with the final blow. In early 2022, the unthinkable happened. Russia went all in on its bluff and invaded Ukraine. While Sri Lanka is 4,000 miles away from the conflict, the extenuating economic circumstances put the nail in the coffin. Ukraine and Russia are by far the largest exporters of wheat in the world. Russia is also the second largest exporter of petroleum. In the wake of the invasion, the West has implemented massive sanctions. In face of such a shock to supply, the cost of importing food and energy has skyrocketed. Only a month after the invasion, the Sri Lankan government could no longer afford to keep the exchange rate fixed. And in a matter of days, the rupee lost 30% of its value. Then, just a month after, the Sri Lankan foreign reserves had approached zero. It makes annual debt payments in the billions. It no longer can afford them. That is why on April 12th, the government announced it will no longer be making such payments and is seeking to renegotiate the terms of its debts. But this is very likely to be too little too late. When the IMF renegotiates debts or provides bailouts, it wants to be reasonably assured that it will actually help the country short term so that it can pay off its debts eventually. 
with a government headed by a strongman that has a poor economic track record who has let the situation spiral out of control and is now facing overwhelming social unrest, it's unlikely the IMF will provide serious relief efforts. Problems are further accelerated by the ongoing trends. The United States' economy, due to being showered in stimulus money over the past couple of years, is overheating and inflation is at its highest level in over 40 years. As such, the Fed has begun to pursue an aggressive increase in interest rates. These rates not only affect the US, but dramatically increase the cost of borrowing money across the world. For now, basic necessities in Sri Lanka have become too expensive. The rupee is now just half of its original value. Schools have stopped testing for certain grades because they can't buy ink. When food is available, people quickly buy as much as they possibly can because they know they might not be able to afford it tomorrow, which has led to major shortages. The government has instituted daily 15-hour blackouts to save on energy imports, but they have crippled industries. The nation has declared a state of emergency as massive mobs attack politicians and even set roadblocks to prevent them from escaping the country, with little hope for a large enough immediate bailout and worsening global economic economic trends. This means the situation and suffering of the average Sri Lankan will worsen and could even result in devastating domestic conflict and starvation. But this is not where the story ends. When the world is growing and showered with cheap capital, like it had been for the past decade, countries with weak economic fundamentals could not only get by, but thrive. Even with the lockdowns, they could keep their economies intact. But with rapid global commodity inflation, supply shortages, and the likely coming global recession, many nations appear to be on the tipping point. There is growing unrest in Tunisia because of prices, Pakistan's currency is plummeting, and Argentina's economy is straining under the weight of massive debt. The longer current conditions persist, the more likely we are to see what is happening in Sri Lanka to happen across the globe. Sri Lankans just a few months ago were buying cars, having access to modern amenities, and living ordinary lives in a quickly developing country. Today, they are unsure if they can buy food tomorrow. The strength of an economy, and thus its nation, should be measured by its weaknesses rather than its wealth.